This is not the dot-com situation. We have problems with people having invested in business plans for which there was no reality. The people building fiber optic cable for which there was no need. Homes that are occupied may see an ebb and flow in the price at a certain percentage level, but you're not going to see the collapse that you see when people talk about a bubble. The Federal Reserve credit created during the last eight months has not stimulated economic growth in technology or the industrial section. But a lot of it ended up in the expanding real estate bubble, churned by the $3.2 trillion of debt maintained by the uh, GSEs, the government-sponsored agents' enterprises. The GSEs, made up of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Federal Home Loan Bank, have managed to keep the housing market afloat, in contrast to the more logical slowdown in hotel and office construction. Instead of the newly inflated money being directed toward the stock market, it now finds its way into the rapidly expanding real estate bubble. This too will burst, as all bubbles do. The Fed, the Congress, or even foreign investors can't prevent the collapse of this bubble any more than the incestuous Japanese banks were able to keep the Japanese miracle of the 1980s going forever. Concerned Federal Reserve economists are struggling to understand how the wealth effect of the stock market and real estate bubbles affect economic activity and consumer spending. It should be no mystery, but it would be too much to expect the Fed to look to itself and its monetary policy for an explanation and assume responsibility for engineering the entire financial mess we're in. A lot of concern now has been expressed about the collapsing of this housing bubble. It's a shame that we had not talked about this 10 or 15 years ago when many free market economists predicted it would come and worried about it and wished we could have prevented it. But the irony of all this now is that everything that caused the, fi the financial bubble, the housing bubble, uh, we're resorting to doing the same thing. You can't solve the problem of inflation with inflation. The debasement of the currency, which is a continual process, is the reason we get financial problems and financial bubbles. Whether it was in the 1920s or the NASDAQ bubble or the housing bubble. We have to deal with the cause. We're dealing and we talk so much about our solutions, but nobody's talking about the cause. And the cause literally is the excessive credit created by the Federal Reserve System, and we can't deny this. And then we add fuel to the fire by credit allocation. We come in with uh, the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act. We come in with insurance by the FHA. Uh, we come in with the GSEs and the line of credit and the, and the guaranteed in, in, uh, implied uh, bailouts. And then when the collapse comes, all we have, what do we do? We ask for more regulation, more credit, more debasement of the currency. In the four years since the inspectors left, intelligence reports show that Saddam Hussein has worked to rebuild his chemical and biological weapons stock, his missile delivery capability, and his nuclear program. He has also given aid, comfort, and sanctuary to terrorists, including Al-Qaeda members. It is clear, however, that if left unchecked, Saddam Hussein will continue to increase his capacity to wage biological and chemical warfare and will keep trying to develop nuclear weapons. Should he succeed in that endeavor, he could alter the political and security landscape of the Middle East, which as we know all too well, affects American security. This is a very difficult vote. This is probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make. Any vote that might lead to war should be hard. But I cast it with conviction. When uh, Secretary Powell was before our committee, he was very clear to us that Saddam Hussein's military is very, very weak, and much weaker than it was when he was defeated 12 years ago. And uh, that sort of goes by everybody, and they keep talking about presumptions. 
maybe someday he's going to get something and maybe someday he's going to do this and he might build a weapon and he is trying to get these things so it's pretty vague accusations have you seen or heard anything from the CIA the Pentagon the State Department of the White House to suggest that Saddam Hussein is planning an attack on the United States uh, no I, I see nothing eminent he doesn't have an Air Force he he doesn't have a Navy and he can't even shoot down, a, he didn't shoot one of our airplanes down in 12 years, and his army is one-third it was in 12 years ago. So, you know, this fiction that he's Hitler and he's about to take over the Middle East is, is a, I think it's a stretch. You've been consistent in your conservative positions. You oppose abortion, you like low taxes, you want us back on the gold standard. What is your philosophical basis for opposing a war with Iraq? Well, you, you know, the, the long historic definition of the, uh, the and it's actually a Christian definition of the just war influences me, that it has to be uh, defensive, it has to be declared by the proper authorities, and uh, you have to uh, be willing to win the war, uh, prompts me to look at what the founders said. And uh, they want us to declare the war, the responsibilities on the House and, and the Senate to make the declaration and that we should win it. Now if you were, you were president and you knew that bin Laden was in Pakistan, you knew where, would you have U.S. forces go in after him? Larry, I, I, I'm not going to go there, and here's why, because Pakistan is a sovereign nation. I think the Pakistanis want uh, bin Laden out of their hair and out of their country, and is causing great difficulties in Pakistan. It's so I, I don't know where he is, nor do I, you know, I, I just don't spend that much time on him, I'll be honest with you. I, I We gave the president authority to go into uh, Afghanistan, and here we have Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. They have nuclear weapons, and we're giving them money. And we forgot about him, and now we're over in, uh, in Iraq in a war that's bogging us down, and we have forgotten against, uh, about dealing with the people that attacked us. And here The Congress and the President will shift radically toward expanding the size and scope of the federal government. This will satisfy both the liberals and the conservatives. Military and police powers will grow, satisfying the conservatives. The welfare state, both domestic and international, will expand, satisfying the liberals. Both sides will endorse military adventurism overseas. This is the most important of my predictions. Policy changes could prevent all of the previous predictions from occurring. Unfortunately, that will not occur. In due course, the Constitution will continue to be steadily undermined and the American Republic further weaken. During the next decade, the American people will become poorer and less free, while they become more dependent on the government for economic security. The war will, be, will prove to be divisive with emotions and hatred growing between the various factions and special interests that drive our policies in the Middle East. Agitation from more class warfare will, will succeed in dividing us domestically. And believe it or not, I expect lobbyists will thrive more than ever during the dangerous period of chaos. I have no timetable for these predictions, but just in case, keep them around and look at them in five to 10 years. Let's hope and pray that I'm wrong on all accounts. If so, I will be very pleased.